This is a Celebration 125 podcast. Oh, I got another little story to tell you with a punk kid that don't know nothing. They, <laughs> we're about, as I say, four or five hundred feet down below the home tree where the crummy picked us up. And the main line had stranded the eye. And uh, so he blew slack off and they're going to cut the eye off and splice the new eye that's on the end of the main line. So anyway, uh, I came, I went into the landing and and Fleming Point, he's, he's a real character, he's a real nice guy, and he said, oh yeah, he said, uh, they need that, <clears throat> that eye off of the track side for a lug on the yard or, or a slack puller. And I thought, well, that's, boy, that's a tough deal. It's about 10 feet long, and uh, that was about seven-eighths line with a rotten eye on the end of this. So anyway, I thought, well, I better do what I, do what I want. And Norm Harris and them, they were kind of laughing. And Norm said, no, you head out there because... We'll catch up with you. The Crumbie will be waiting. So anyway, I fought that eye all when the day passed me. I was still a couple of hundred feet from the crummy. Um, they passed me in there. I should have known. I should have threw the thing down. But anyway, we <laughs> we came into the landing, and Frank Gallardi was there, and he said, uh, where are you going with that? And I said, oh, they need it for a slack puller or a lug on the yard. And he said, uh, show me the guy that told you to pack that up here. And I thought, oh, oh, oh I better. And everybody was in like it was a two-ton truck with the open back end. Everybody sitting in there. And I know they must have been just laughing at that fool packing that up there. And he said, uh, show me which guy told him and I said oh no everybody did well then so uh anyway yeah yeah they're waiting for you so get in there so I got in the crummy and I left, and <laughs> it was quite quiet there there's not much talking going on but they're all laughing at that fool of a kid packing that eye up there and then the next morning uh Gillardi came down to the stump and he said, point out the guy that told you to pack that eye up. He said, I'll can them right now. And I, I, I really didn't, you know, you're dealing with the boss. So I said, no, no, it's, they all did. Well, he couldn't can them all. And old Naslin, he really, I think he felt a bit sorry for me because he was real good to me that day. And... <laughs> Anyway, we finished that coal deck pile and then moved over to the next setting and we're cutting saplings around where we found an old Naslin was limbing a spar tree, it was a fir, and uh, some of the limbs were fairly big. So he hollered down with a few swear words, get that blonde punk to go and get my saw, it's over on the yarder. And I took a look at him and I thought, yeah, he's about 50 feet up. I bet I can make it to that track side before he captured me. And I thought, I, I'm gonna walk off. I thought about it and I thought I could get out of there before he caught me. So uh, anyway, I hiked her up to the track side and a guy, Gordon Duncan, guy from Harris Mill, he was in the logging truck, and Frenchy Demers, I knew him from my dad, and Norm Francis, they, they, they said, oh, did the old run you off, Naslin, and I, I just thought, no, I'm getting out of here, and ah, well, we didn't think you'd stay, so anyway, I got a ride with Gordon Duncan down the logging truck down the camp. And Ronnie Halstead was the timekeeper. I told him to make out my time. I was leaving, so I 
got my junk out of the bunkhouse and threw it in the mud, laying lead out of there. And <laughs> I found out later, Norm Harris was saying, we looked for you for two hours up there. They figured you fell under a log or something. And then somebody went up to the track side and they said, oh no, he took off with a log and track. Well then old Madeline, I thought, well, I'll never see him again anyway. As we were coming home, I was going by Canfor, well, Canadian Forest then, and I stopped in and we hired out there Punk and Russell's on side five. Like, it was really easy to get a job then. You could leave one and have one in no time. And uh, the old hooker was Eric Turnquist, an old hooker, and he really was a good guy. I couldn't believe the hookers that talked to you. And, you know, <laughs> and in camp, it was a good camp and a good grub, and oh, they're good guys. And old Danny Francis, he was running yarder, real, really good. Well, when they shut down, like for winter time, we went and worked for <clears throat> the survey gang when they're doing the highway between Deroche and uh, to the Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. So we worked there through the winter, and then uh, I went back to Watkins. I worked for Watkins up on Agassiz Mountain for a couple of months. And then I thought, gee, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind going to Larson. It looked like a good place. There was stuff everywhere. I phoned there, and well, they didn't know. So uh, I uh, finally phoned him. Yeah, yeah, come on up. He said, well, how about potlatching on the road? And I thought, oh, yeah, that's good. That's better than the rigging anyway. So uh, there was an old road man there by the name of Munson, and I worked with him, and and pick rocks behind the grader. A guy by the name of Pesky was on the grader. The Kelly boys from Chilliwack, they're all driving truck, and there's another, there's another good camp. And they started at six in the morning, and then, uh, gee, you came in for supper, but it was kind of in camp, so I always would go out to the shop and look around and whatnot. And the head mechanic there was a guy by the name of Pat Collins. He was an American from Bellingham and said, do you like it around there? And I, oh, yeah, this is a good place. He said, well, do you ever change any tires? And I said, no, on my Model A. And, oh, he said, we've always got tires here. So anyway, <laughs> there was about five bridge ties and they had them spiked together so it was kind of a platform and the, there's no end of it. They're 1122 truck tires and they're all on Dayton rims which is good to handle. So he said uh, how about doing some tires so he showed me where the patch and stuff was and uh, rigged above the tires and the tire hammer, and there was a mechanic there by the name of Bert Paquin, a real good mechanic, an old guy, smoked cigars, and Clarence, they're both, they were older guys, but good mechanics, so it ended up, we started changing, <laughs> changing tires, everybody thought that was a horrible job, but I liked it, and they didn't have any tire soap, so Pat said, go to the bull cook there and get some soap, bar of soap. So I jacked up the bull cook and he gave me a bar of soap. So we used soap for that and a bit of water. It worked real good. And then Pat took me aside and he said, remember now clean the lock rings. And he said, clean that groove out of the wheel. Make sure it's your life because if they blow up, kill you and they didn't have a most outfits had a rake that you put a tire in but then some of them blew up and killed the guy anyway because they weren't made good enough but Pat told me to lean it again that stump 
and then don't go in front of it and plug the air into it, let it blow it up there. If it blew, it blew out in the brush. But anyway, he said, if you make sure the rings, and he said, any marks for that, you file it off or grind it or tell Bert or Clarence, if it looks bad at all, throw it away. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we changed tires there, but it was real good. I could work. I didn't like camp life because it was a dead loss after supper, nothing to do, just perfect. And then we got in, they needed a hand sometimes in the shop, so we got in there and did a few brake jobs on the power wagons, and we got working pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then they had a, a gravel truck, an EQ Mac, and no doors, no fenders, just perfect old truck. The guy that was driving it, he came in, and the battery cables were hanging, dragging on the ground. I guess Pat said, well, where's the battery going? Oh, I don't know. Well, how are you going to start it tomorrow? Oh, that's something our job, I said. So he canned them right there and then said, you want to go on the gravel truck with Gordy, the other guy, and he had one of them prime mover Max from the mm -hmm. short, or uh, Cleveland Dam. Can for had a bunch of them. They were good gravel trucks. We started on that and then had a little Perry Powell shovel that was made in the machine shop in Mission. It always needed a little tinkering. And we loaded ourselves with it and then hauled gravel. And then it ended up uh, pesky. He, he quit. So then we went on the grader. We graded the road and changed tires. And we could work. <laughs> well, I work all I could. I go to bed at dark. <laughs> and have to start at six so mm -hmm. but it was good we made good money and i yeah. really enjoyed it well bunk and, one thing that's very clear in what you're saying is that you really have a passion for logging there's nothing like it <laughs> it's nice to work outdoors isn't it it seemed i never have no good at school work or nothing but logging oh i don't know it just it really, I don't know, I seem to like the mountains and the streams and the water and just everything to me. I miss it now. Well, thanks for your wonderful stories about your logging days, and we really appreciate that. There's no end of it, John. 